Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Independent Policy Forum this evening. Um, many of you have been here in the past, and as you may recall, we hold events like this here in our conference center in Oakland and also in Washington on a regular basis. Um, the Independent Policy Forum is designed to feature uh, authors, especially of, we think, important new books. Um, the programs vary from being uh, lectures, debates, uh, seminars, and other formats, and tonight is certainly no exception. Um, I think this is day 77, I believe, of the Obama administration. So we're approaching the 100th, the, um, this, this alleged magical point of 100 days uh, next month. The event um, we're here to um, uh, enjoy is entitled, What President Obama Should Learn from His Predecessors. And I'm particularly delighted to have as speakers uh, our senior fellow Ivan Eland. And uh, Ivan, as you may know, is author of, of the new book called Recarving Rushmore, Ranking the Presidents on Peace, Prosperity, and Liberty. Some of you may have also seen Ivan on C-SPAN. Uh, C-SPAN has a program called Afterwards, and he was interviewed starting um, yesterday, actually it was on Sunday, by Ron, Congressman Ron Paul, and that program is about an hour long, and it's being shown uh, repeatedly on C-SPAN. You can also go to the C-SPAN Book TV website and see the video on it. So I highly recommend that, um, as well as tonight's event. Um, other, other speaker is Stanford University political scientist Andrew Rutten. And Andy is um, uh, associate editor of our journal, which is entitled The Independent Review. It's a quarterly journal and is edited by another one of our senior fellows, whose name is Robert Higgs. I might also mention that uh, we're very pleased that at the same time, uh, C-SPAN also decided to feature Dr. Higgs on another program of theirs called In Depth. They pick an author each month that they spotlight, and Dr. Higgs is the author they've picked this month. And it's a three-hour interview, and you can also find that on the Book TV website. And that's also being shown uh, repeatedly. This is the book by Dr. Higgs, which um, is most timely right now, called Depression, War, and Cold War. And um, I was just informed by um, uh, one of our friends here, Bert. Uh, you want to read what the headline said? Well, uh, it'll, it'll take me about... 20 seconds, so I'll just say, okay. it said the government is going to spend the TARP funds on life insurance. There's $130 billion left. Right. It's about to go. So anyway, that's part of the kaleidoscope of what's going on. To provide some background uh, for those of you also who are new, and I hope that if you've just joined with us for the first time, you had a chance to pick up a packet. Uh, the Independent Institute is a scholarly public policy research institute. We hold events like this based on new books, and we publish many books and other publications. We also organize many events like this, as well as media projects. Uh, you're welcome to visit our website, which, as you can see, is independent.org. You'll find many, many studies, transcripts of events, videos, and, and so forth. Our, our blog on the website is called The Beacon, which I also encourage you to, to check out. And you're all invited to receive our weekly email newsletter, which is called The Lighthouse. And you can do that on our homepage. America's first president, George Washington, noted that, quote, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, a troublesome servant and a fearful master, Never for a moment should it be left to irresponsible action, unquote. The subject of our event today is the use of power by American presidents. The US presidency is by far the most powerful position in the world today. Indeed, the US government is almost entirely the president. The budgets of the Congress and the Supreme Court are virtually inconsequential compared with that of the executive branch. The presidency, after all, includes all the departments of the federal government, including Treasury, Commerce, Defense, Labor, and so forth. 
the IRS, CIA, NSA, NASA, the FBI, SEC, all of the U.S.'s nuclear and other weapons, spy satellites, aircraft carriers, ICBMs, hundreds of military bases worldwide, the huge tracts of federal lands, minerals, highways, and waterways. I mentioned the SEC, but you also have the FTC, the FDA, OSHA, the EPA. Quite frankly, the list is just so long, it would take hours to go through just the list. I'm not sure if you've ever seen attempts for, of people to try and draw up an organizational chart of the federal government. It, it really defies um, anybody's ability to do that. But to be so per pervasive and so powerful, the presidency is really far more than just these agencies. Although the U.S. was founded as a republic opposed to royalism and absolutism, for most Americans, the imperial presidency has really become their sovereign king and father figure who stands above and beyond us as mere, mere citizens in order to oversee our lives and our well-being. As such, the presidency is really a secular divinity, an earthly messiah, who many believe will save them from all forms of harm by wielding government power against others, even if this means trampling on lives, liberties, and property. As a result, around the presidency has really grown a cult of power and personality not unlike those that we found with rulers of the past. The spectacle and circus of the presidential inauguration this past January for Barack Obama is really only a tiny inkling of what we see day in, day out in the media with the glorification and worship of presidential power. But stripped of such superficial pomp and vanity, what do we really have? Doesn't each president, after all, take an oath to preserve and protect the U.S. Constitution and its limits on executive power? So how did Barack Obama, George Bush, and their predecessors stack up in holding this pledge? Have they increased peace, prosperity, and liberty, as the subtitle of Ivan's book is, is considering? Was Lord Acton correct in counseling, and the founders correct in being mindful of, power corrupts and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely? So I'm very pleased to have Ivan with us this evening. Um, he is Senior Fellow and Director of the Center on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute in our Washington office. He received his Master's Degree in, political, in Applied Economics and PhD in Public Policy from George Washington University. He earlier spent 15 years working for Congress on budget and national security issues, including the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the Congressional Budget Office and Government Accounting Office, Accountability Office, and he's testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, House Government Reform Committee, and Senate Judiciary Committee. His articles have appeared in many newspapers and magazines and journals, and we're very pleased to be um, the publisher of Ivan's book, Recarving Rushmore. Uh, thanks, David, uh, for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be back out in California again. Uh, giving this book talk and some other book talks around the Bay Area. Um, I'll just tell you why I wrote this book on recarving Rushmore. Um, I, I was on one radio station and some irate caller called in and, and, and said, how can you deface this national treasure you're advocating defacing the, the monument? And I said, I had to explain, you know, you know, it's a work of art, it's an engineering feat for its time. And I don't really want to, um, change the actual monument. It's a metaphor for, say, for just saying that, that, uh, that maybe we ought to reconsider some of the people that we, we've put up there, uh, and maybe they, maybe they uh, uh, don't deserve to be up there. Um, and of course, when you write a book like this, you're taking on national icons, uh, particularly Lincoln, Jefferson, and Theodore Roosevelt. George Washington, I think we can probably leave up there. But, um, <laughs> And maybe Thomas Jefferson, if we're not talking about what he did as president, but uh, the Declaration of Independence. If it's a great American, it's fine. But then, of course, Ben Franklin and a bunch of other people that weren't president should probably be up there, too. So, um, But anyway, I, I, having looked at uh, the literature and uh, looked at the polls of his, historians, uh, journalists, and political scientists, uh, routinely rank uh, FDR, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson, Lincoln, um, Washington as among the greatest presidents. Uh, it's pretty consistent even among left 
and right, although there are some variations. Reagan naturally tends to rank higher among the conservatives, and um, JFK ranks a little higher among the left side of the uh, political spectrum. What I tried to do was um, <coughs> uh, cut through the biases, which I believe uh, those analysts have, uh, and I'll go over some of those briefly and try to just focus on policies. Uh, historians uh, a lot of times get caught up in charisma. They like to say that they don't, but uh, people like Teddy, look at how many books have been written about Teddy Roosevelt. Now, there's one charismatic guy. I mean, look at Reagan. Reagan is a very, is a very charismatic character uh, in the modern times, Clinton, uh, and even Obama today. Uh, a second bias they have is one of activism. Uh, we like to see bold, dynamic action. But sometimes uh, acting is uh, doing uh, whatever it is is not a good thing for the country. Uh, the third bias is if the president served during a time of uh, crisis or war. Uh, and a lot of times the analysis uh, doesn't really go into, well, could the, this crisis or war have been avoided? Could the president have mitigated it? Could uh, he have, you know, could he have gotten out of it? Uh, could he have done an alternative policy? Uh, so there's a sort of a correlation between the event happening and him being ranked higher in the rankings uh, than they should be. And uh, some of these presidents have gotten us into uh, what I believe were unnecessary wars. In fact, there are many wars that have, were unnecessary and could have probably been avoided and should have been avoided. Uh, so I rank the presidents based on policy, whether, they, whether their policies tend to promote peace, prosperity, and liberty, and also whether they tried to stick within the framers' original intent when they, when they uh, made, uh, created the Constitution, and that was of a limited executive. Now, we've come far away from that, and as David mentioned, the executive branch is way more powerful uh, than, the, than, uh, than I think the founders intended it to be. And in fact, it's just taken over the entire government. The government is the executive branch. And uh, Congress, in my view, has really uh, been diminished in power. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit later. But so I, I rank presidents based on whether they were uh, uh, more restrained as an executive, whether they uh, were restrained in foreign policy, which was the original foreign policy of the US. Uh, and also whether they tried to limit government, because that was the original idea of the United States when it was first founded, that all these monarchs were oppressing their people and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence said that the government should uh, uh, protect people's rights, not violate them, which was sort of a unique, you know, idea uh, at the time. And so uh, how have the presidents uh, uh, you know, fared in, 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 uh, in doing all that. Uh, and I, I also uh, would say that you have to take a president at his point in time. I mean, the government's not going to go away uh, overnight, and many of these presidents uh, inherited a behemoth when they came to power. But so I ranked them on the margins. Did they take us back towards what the founders had uh, envisioned or uh, onward toward the uh, behemoth state. So, I, and I try to also uh, be nonpartisan in the book uh, because I think I try to take a hard look at the policies and not what party. And I also found as I went along that party really didn't matter as much as one would think because presidents tend to uh, have similar policies that served uh, at, at the same time or near, well, not, not at the same time, but near each other in, in the, in the, uh, uh, chronology of the of the country. For instance, uh, <laughs> LBJ and Nixon had a, had a, had similar policies. I think Carter and Reagan had similar policies uh, to some extent. And uh, uh, and I'm going to start with Hoover and FDR. Now you say, well, how does this relate to Obama? Well, I'm going to get there. So I, I'd first like to talk talk about Hoover and FDR. Unfortunately, I think there is some relevance to today because I think the same thing is happening as happened back back then. Hopefully, we won't have a Great Depression, uh, but I think what the government is doing uh, in the economy is probably negative. Uh, but uh, let me start with Hoover and FDR. Um, Hoover has the reputation of being a do-nothing president, but that's sort of a fallacy because he was actually a progressive Republican, what we call progressive. 
but uh, he, he actually enshrined uh, many precedents that FDR simply expanded, and FDR did expand them greatly, but Hoover uh, actually did m uh, much more to take us away from the limited government that uh, the founders had envisioned. Uh, it's a fallacy that uh, Hoover uh, didn't want to was, you know, didn't want to do anything about the depression. In fact, um, what he did was, uh, in short, was he didn't let the market correct a uh, what would have been a mundane recession, and his policies uh, helped uh, turn it into a Great Depression. And then, of course, FDR came along and aggravated even that. So um, Hoover enshrined the belief that uh, the government should ensure people's economic well-being. That was a, a unique thing. We all take it for granted. Now everybody says, well, what's Obama going to do about the economy? But back in the 19th century, people said, well, we don't want the government in the, in the economy because they're going to screw it up. And so uh, it, was, it was a negative thing. Uh, and of course, FDR expanded and enshrined this belief that the government was responsible for people's economic well-being. Now Hoover gets the gets the um, uh, moniker of a do-nothing president simply because uh, his regulations pale in comparison, and his intervention in the economy pale in comparison to FDR. For instance, uh, Hoover had voluntary regulations. Well, we all know what voluntary means. The government says, well, we want you to do this voluntarily, and if you don't, then we're going to slap mandatory regulations on you. Well, of course, FDR came in and uh, cartelized industry, which raises prices uh, for, pe for poor people during the Depression, uh, had mandatory regulations in financial, uh, the financial communication, transportation, and energy areas. Of course, Jimmy Carter, those were the very uh, industries that Jimmy Carter later deregulated. Uh, he, uh, Hoover had uh, loans to banks, railroads, and homeowners. Of course, FDR came along, had the bank holiday, FDIC, took us off the gold standard, et cetera. And of course, uh, started uh, the problem that we now have of banks uh, being cushioned so that they can't fail. Uh, in agriculture, Ho Hoover had loans to farmers. FDR went to, uh, to full-blown subsidies to farmers. Uh, you're getting the idea here. Unemployment, uh, both Hoover and FDR th thought public works were they weren't, it wasn't going to be effective because it gave people meaningless temporary jobs that weren't really uh, real jobs in the r real economy. But of course, both presidents did them anyway to, because they had to be perceived as doing something. And of course, FDR went whole hog and created the CCC, the WPA, the PWA, and the CWA. And I can't even keep those m straight myself. So um, uh, Hoover uh, had loans to states to provide unemployment benefits because he didn't believe that the g federal government could uh, should give grants. Well, of course, FDR came in and changed the loans to grants. So you're getting the idea that Hoover set a lot of precedents and FDR came in. Now, how does this relate to Bush and Obama? Because I think, again, it's a Republican to Democratic handover. And I think what's happening now, uh, Hoover uh, provided uh, more credit into a market that had excessive credit in it. And we, we have plenty of credit in the system. It's frozen now because people are afraid to lend. But they're doing the same thing now, and uh, including we're now in, uh, printing money. Uh, the Fed is printing money, and uh, th this is uh, um, going to cause long-term inflation. Uh, during, the, uh, during the late 20s, um, Hoover saw that demand for products was declining and prices were going down, as happens during any recession. But of course, instead of letting that happen, uh, and, and we hear all these fears, excessive fears of deflation now, what uh, Hoover did was he jawboned business to not to decrease wages and not to decrease employment. Now, most economists will tell you that in a recession, one of those has to go down. Uh, you either have to, if, you're, if you have less demand for your product, you're either going to have to lay some people off or if, you, if you're not going to lay people off, you have to cut everybody's wages. But uh, of course, Hoover uh, job owned businesses to keep those two up so he didn't let the market correct. He also incre uh, pressured businessmen to increase investment. Now the worst thing you can do is if, you're, if you have a lower demand for your product is build a new factory, right? I mean, who, who would do that, right? Well, that's what Hoover was doing. Now I think Bush and Obama are doing the same thing. They're not letting the, uh, 
the market correct uh, uh, for the uh, correct and go back to equilibrium. And in fact, they're artificially inflating the the economy, and so it'll have farther to fall to equilibrium, which will probably aggravate the uh, recession. I'm not predicting a Great Depression, but I think. Uh, the government is probably making it worse by what it's doing. It's tr sort of trying to fool us to make to to make us believe that the recession isn't going to be bad, and of course, in doing that, it's making it worse. Um, there was the Smoot-Hawley protectionist tariffs during the 30s, which of course um, uh, aggravated the Great Depression, and now we see some uh, pressure on worldwide for protectionism now because when people get laid off and all that sort of thing, they want to keep the jobs at home and um, uh, put up high tariffs, which is, of course, the worst thing that you can do. And of course, we've seen the, the, the public works uh, that, that Obama has proposed. Uh, and as I mentioned, Hoover and FDR uh, didn't really believe those would work. I mean, uh, we're, they've dressed it up, but we're not just uh, digging ditches and filling them back in, as we actually did it during the Depression to some extent. Um, there were other projects too, but but these are dressed up as high-tech um, initiatives and that sort of thing. But it's the same thing. It's public works. Uh, FDR nationalized the rubber production and petroleum distribution during World War II. And of course, Bush, I always get a kick out of the Republicans saying that Obama's a socialist. Um, I had one guy, uh, I was in uh, Central America, and he, he said to me, uh, he was a Republican, he said, wow, uh, uh, Obama's such a socialist. And I said, well, you don't have to worry about uh, Obama taking us to socialism because Bush has already brought us there. And you know, he really didn't have anything to say because Bush uh, nationalized AIG, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and has bought 30% of the banks. Socialism is meaning it means just the the government owning the business, owning business, right? Now, Obama, of course, is not uh, uh, clean either because uh, he's created more of a welfare state with uh, well expanded the welfare state by doing the public works. Uh, and he's now into managing banks and or auto companies. So, and of course, they're increasing regulation. And uh, at the time, uh, FDR during World War II uh, commandeered uh, companies and told them what to produce. But of course, we have two wars going on, but, we, but we're not to the point where uh, we're during, uh, we have such a uh, conflagration as World War II. These are small wars but they are sapping the economy. So I think there are parallels, unfortunately, between what Hoover and FDR did and what uh, Bush and Obama have done. And uh, this is probably not going to work out very well, unfortunately. Now I'll move into foreign policy. And well, I, first I want to say uh, one thing about Bush. Bush liked to compare himself to Reagan, but the closest parallel in my mind is LBJ. Uh, he, has a gun, he had a guns and butter policy. Uh, we had, he spent more on domestic programs than any president since LBJ. He was not a conservative by any means, even by re uh, Republican standards or even by Democratic standards, I don't think. Uh, he was a big, big spender, and it wasn't just on defense. Um, uh, he had, we had the first new entitlement program since Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, the Medicare Drug Benefit, which piled a humongous benefit on a system that's about ready to collapse. Um, so. Um, you know, we, we have this, uh, these ideas that uh, Bush is compar uh, comparable to Reagan when he's not really comparable to Reagan at all, uh, except maybe in the fact that Reagan increased federal spending as a proportion of GDP and so did Bush, but that's, that's probably where the comparison ends. Now, uh, as far as foreign policy goes, um, we now have two conflicts, uh, brush fire conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. This is most uh, similar, I think, to the Spanish-American War, where we had the same uh, thing occur. We went in smashing conventional military victory, but then we had this uh, a nagging guerrilla uh, action that we never ant anticipated. Uh, and that's where we are in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, during those wars, we also had, uh, during the Spanish-American War, we also had executive uh, expansion. Many people say that Teddy Roosevelt created the modern presidency with the bully pulpit and that sort of thing. But I think if you look closely, uh, Teddy Roosevelt gets uh, much too much credit. Uh, and I would say 
probably criticism for that because McKinley, who was a very dull man uh, during the Spanish-American War, managed to grab a lot of power and start us on the road to the modern uh, Reed expansive presidency. Um, of course, in the Spanish-American War, we also had uh, torture uh, as well, and uh, uh, they burnt villages and all sorts of different things. Uh, it was the same, these guerrilla wars are very messy because you don't know who the enemy is and uh, the soldiers, whatever army, get mad because it's not a bunch of guys in defined battles uh, with uh, easily discernible uniforms on the other side. It's people springing, surprising people uh, from uh, coming right out of the population as they did in Vietnam. And uh, these wars, I think, probably do have more atrocities than, than conventional wars, although certainly there are atrocities in conventional wars as well. Um, now, what we have now I also, I think, is an executive expansion. Bush uh, had a great uh, expansion of the executive branch. But I'd like to examine Obama's record on three major things that I think uh, he is not completely clean on. Uh, we, we, he has the high profile closing Guantanamo thing. Of course, it's not closed yet, and there are many tough decisions what to do about these prisoners. But when you look at uh, some of the things, uh, the torture, he is better than Bush on that. But he's, uh, Panetta, in a hearing, still has reserved to use extraordinary tactics under certain circumstances, which is still sort of a loophole there. Uh, we also have the domestic wiretapping program, which has now been legal, legalized by Congress after the Democrats in Congress yelled and screamed. Of course, then they rolled over and legalized what was an illegal program, an unconstitutional program. Uh, and so uh, th that's still happening. Uh, and also, the Obama administration is using the secrecy defense uh, to defend the entire domestic wiretapping program instead of. Uh, using secrecy as it was used, uh, national security uh, defense uh, was used in certain cases for certain evidence. Now it's uh, being used as a whole program. And uh, just yesterday, uh, Obama, the Obama Justice Department def defended the use of the, uh, say, said in this trial that they couldn't uh, disclose uh, th elements of the program simply because. Um, the, it would uh, uh, divulge sources and methods of intelligence, which is, of course, the same defense that Bush had for it. Now, the final area is on the um, indefinite detention uh, uh, of prisoners, and I think that is still going on to some extent as well, uh, without trial. So I think what you see here is that wars uh, tend to expand executive power and it never and I think Obama probably has good intentions in retracting some of these uh, civil liberties offenses but the the, the uh, lust for power I think when you get in and the the fact that you the other president has left you from some pretty sticky uh, decisions to make has certainly uh, led to the ratchet effect where it goes uh, it goes up and then it comes back down, but it doesn't go back to where it was before. So you get a net increase. And I think that's where we are with Obama because I think he is he's keeping around some, quietly keeping some of uh, Bush's policies around, which is not surprising uh, when you look at it historically because that's usually what, what, it ha what happens. Now, Obama is also uh, like Nixon in Vietnam, I think, He's escalating and de-escalating uh, wars at the same time. And if you remember, Nixon had the Vietnamization, which was supposed to take the U.S. war effort and, you know, let uh, leave it in Vietnamese hands. Uh, and he was also ending the draft, and he was doing this to cut the domestic protest. While at the same time, uh, he was launching secret wars in Laos and Cambodia to prevent. Uh, the communists from having a sanctuary in those countries. Uh, so Obama is uh, surging in Afghanistan at the same time he's pledging to withdraw uh, there eventually, and he's also uh, pledged to uh, at least draw down troops in Iraq, which I don't think is ever going to happen. I don't think we're ever going to go to zero because I think they really would like to have those bases there. Um, 
Now, I think also this is sort of similar to Obama's uh, spending large, huge sums of money to stimulate the economy, but then also pledging to reduce the deficit in the long term. It's sort of, you know, a contradiction in policy, you know, saying, oh, well, we're eventually going to do this, but we're going to do the opposite in the interim. Um, now, I do think Obama's goal in Afghanistan is more realistic than Bush's, simply because he just wants to, well, he says he wants to just uh, eliminate it as a safe haven for terrorists, uh, whereas Bush was into full-blown democratization and nation building, which is a fantasy in both Iraq and, and Afghanistan, and it always was. But uh, I think, uh, again, Obama seems to be doing nation building in a different way. So we'll see what happens. If he eventually withdraws and he uh, goes with his more modest goal, or whether it's just rhetorical. Uh, now, I don't want to say, I don't want to be totally negative. So I think uh, there's been some positive aspects of Obama's plan. But I don't think he's gone far enough in some of these things. Uh, now, just in the paper today, uh, he's launching the biggest restructuring of defense spending and the defense um, department in decades. And if he, if he, he's at least proposing this stuff now, of course, we have many vested interests who will try to knock it down. Uh, while he's not cut it drastically cutting defense spending, which I think ought to be done, he is trying to cut Cold War weapons and excessive weapons that are overkill for, for um, going against conventional foes, such as the Army's future combat system, which is a bunch of robotic tanks and stuff, uh, F-22, which was built uh, originally to, so to fight Soviet fighters uh, that never were built, uh, the Navy destroyer and cruiser program, and he's also cutting uh, combat brigade teams from 48 uh, to 45. Uh, he's increasing uh, counterinsurgency systems, special operations increased uh, 5 percent, Reaper and Predator drones, more money for that, more money for the coastal ship, coastal warship. And, um, I think, you know, of course he needs to cut defense, and I think he needs to cut missile defense more than he did. But he, he is at least trying to um, uh, make the Defense Department uh, uh, able to fight wars that we're actually fighting instead of theoretical wars that we've never, that we'll never fight. But of course, that's not cutting defense. And I think one of the problems that you have when you have a Democrat in power is that they're, they're too, uh, they, they don't challenge the Pentagon enough because they're always, um, you know, uh, hit with this wimpy on defense label that they, they got to shake. The Republicans always uh, try to label them with that. So. Lots of times, Democratic presidents in national security area do foolish things because of uh, uh, thinking that uh, the Republicans are going to criticize them. Of course, LBJ knew we were going to lose Vietnam before he ever went in there, and there's evidence to show that. But he did it anyway because he was afraid that the re Republican right wing would criticize him, even though he completely trounced Goldwater in the 64 election and then proceeded to escalate the war after that. So. Uh, Democratic presidents do have that tendency. Now, I also think that um, President Obama is has recognized something that Bush couldn't process, and that is uh, public opinion in, in Islamic countries does matter, and uh, it is important. And the Republicans were dismissive of this, saying, "Well, you know, we're America. What do we care what these people think?" Well. Of course, uh, if you're trying to drain the swamp of hatred that leads to radical Islamists to be radical Islamist terrorists, uh, it helps to be better liked around the world. So his, Obama's visit to Turkey uh, and having Muslims in his family helps a lot in the Muslim world. However, I think uh, uh, Obama has failed to realize, uh, and that we can't process this in America, that uh, the real problem is non-Muslim forces on Muslim land. This is the problem in Iraq, Afghanistan, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan, in Chechnya, in Palestine. Uh, this is a problem. And uh, until, so as long as we're uh, occupying Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, um, we're going to have a problem uh, with terrorism, blowback terrorism. And uh, I think he is, Obama, as I mentioned, he's pledged to withdraw from Afghanistan, but I think he's got to get out of there sooner rather than later, and he's also got to leverage the total, a total withdrawal in Iraq uh, to, frankly, decentralize the country. And that's what my uh, second new book that coming out this month is on. Uh, what? Oh, I guess I'll hold it up. Um, it's coming out in a couple weeks. 
Um, and I'll just say a brief word about that and then sit down. Um, uh, Tom Ricks recently wrote a book. He's the defense correspondent from Washington Post, very uh, the senior defense correspondent. He's very well respected. He went to Iraq and he interviewed uh, U.S. military people mainly. Uh, he should probably in interview Iraqis, but we never seem to do that. But anyway, his book, uh, most of these military people said the worst is to come in Iraq. And I believe that because I think this is a fractured society. And my book goes into how ethnic, ethno-sectarian conflict uh, subsides and, and then comes back up years, decades, and even centuries uh, later. Uh, so uh, we're not done in Iraq yet. Uh, and I think uh, David Petraeus and uh, General Odierno uh, in the short term, they were able to get Bush out of it and say that things were improving, but in the short term, but in the long term, they probably made things worse because we were training the Shia army um, that's running Iraq and uh, the Kurdish military, which is sort of um, uh, helps them out in the government, but we weren't uh, training the Sunnis and arming them. Well, of course, now uh, we are doing that. So if you're going to have a civil war, now you're going to train all three sides in the Civil War instead of just two. Um, in the book, I go into you know countries with fractured history. Almost always, these things recur. And the, the big issues in Iraq are oil prices going down. That's their major export. You have Kirkuk, which is an oil-producing region that the, both the uh, Sunni Arabs and the Sunni Kurds are fighting over. We've got Sunnis are supposed to be allowed under this program into the Shia armed forces. But of course, the Shia don't really want to do that because they don't trust the Sunnis. And the Shia government doesn't really want to do that. We also have a massive influx of refugees that have to be uh, put somewhere. And the, of course, the tendency of the international community is to try to repatriate them to, into their former homes and neighborhoods, which usually uh, results in more ethnic cleansing uh, in past cases. And we also have a lot of prisoners being let out of jail uh, by the Iraqi government. So in my book, I advocate uh, uh, decentralizing Iraq uh, even more than it currently is. Uh, Iraq consists right now of a bunch of city-states. And I'm afraid that the people who are against decentralization don't recognize this reality already. And so I think we need to uh, work towards recognizing that reality, and the Iraqis have to work this out themselves, because there's also tribal, and in addition to the three main ethno-sectarian groups, there's also tribal uh, issues, and uh, there's also other minor smaller minorities uh, that no one ever talks about, the Turkmen, et cetera. Um, now, you know, the partition, any sort of partition, and I, I ad actually advocate a loose confederation with a weak central government so that uh, they don't fight over it. Uh, because if you have a strong central government, the, the uh, countries, are, the, the different groups are going to fight. And so what you need to do is have local, locally provided security by the already existing militias. No one ever has ever explained to me how we're going to have a peaceful Iraq when all, we have all this gun, all these gun, people with guns, and they're in different groups, and they don't like each other. And, uh, uh, and they're waiting until the U.S. leaves. But you know, the, pre the U.S. press seems to think, oh, Iraq that's a closed deal. It's done. But I don't think it is. Uh, the partition, any sort of partition or uh, loose confederation, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, the research that I did went and looked at a bunch of past partitions, um, which some of which have very bad names, but probably ended up saving people because they divided warring groups. The problem is often where the line is drawn. And you don't want to leave large minorities on the other side. Small minorities are fine. So. I, I advocate in this book uh, a confederation, uh, and it doesn't have to be just a, a confederation of three areas. It can be uh, more if, if groups want to live together in a cosmopolitan areas, such as some cities, you know, that's fine. They can, wor they can work this out themselves. So uh, I'll end it there and, uh, you know, maybe take your questions later if David allows me to. <laughs>